Chapter 1, Fuck Me I'm the Homelander Chapter 1 The glaring horn of the semi-trailer truck penetrated the curtain of rain blanketing the city pinging my brain to stop and turn into its Optimus Prime-sized headlights. Guck, ING and the kep, tie and bams my brain slurred as my eyes closed embracing the enveloping light as the inevitable happened. My eyes open with a gasp and consciousness flows back as cool air enters my lungs. A dream. It was all a dream. Immediately a ringing sensation hits my ears and a splitting headache assaults the back of my head. I briefly try to look around not recognizing where I am. Whose place did I crash at? A cacophony of sounds suddenly attack me and the ringing sensation intensifies muting them as if behind a thick wall. My whole head is now burning and my face feels flushed with heat. I stand off the couch and feel the cold floor underneath my feet. Looking down I realize I'm naked. My brain now feels like it's going to explode and my whole body feels warm. I feel parched. Water, need cold water. I move towards the giant sink on the even more enormous island only to find my limbs uncoordinated. I turn the tap on and don't even bother with finding a cup, instead I use my hands and greedily direct the flow of water into my mouth. The refreshing feeling cools down my insides and I slowly feel the ringing tone down. Fucking inception bombs, always terrible the next day. I throw my whole face in the jet and let it cool my head. The headache is slowly receding away. Ha, huh, maybe it won't be so bad today. My stomach feels fine now that I think about it. I didn't even take Pepto before going out last night. As the last remnants of the headache disappear I turn the jet off and stand wiping the water in my eyes with my hands. It's as I do the typical shaking the water out of my hands into the sink I notice something off in the spotless polished surface of the tap. What the fuck? I feel my heart rate rise up again as I take my eyes off the tap and look around again taking in every detail of the spacious living room in front of me. I see full-length mirror on the opposite side of the apartment closer to the giant windows. I practically leap there only to fall unseemingly into the couch. What the fuck is going on? I feel panic surging through my stomach to condense into a knot of anxiety as I rise. My body is disproportioned and I just jumped from basically standing position across the large spacious living room, an impossible length. As I face the mirror I freeze. A sculpted body as if I was a swimmer, blonde hair, sharp deep blue eyes, ski sloped nose, square of jaw with a pointed chin and a face that while not mine I recognize well enough. Holy crap I'm Anthony Starr. My first thought is then the memories hit me like a bulldozer bringing back the migraine in full force. I clutch my head as I drop to the floor gasping for breath with teary eyes as the ringing intensifies and I feel as if the back of my head will explode. Images of men in white coats prodding and poking, being tied up on a tables while they try to dissect me. Feeling the pressure of the scalpels unable to break my skin, getting angry and feeling pressure in my eyes. Being shot at with increasingly larger weapons, feeling the pain of the bullets hitting, then explosions, being drowned, lasers trying to burn me, poison burning my insides. Pain so much pain. Push harder. Faster. I hear the stern voice of the man. An unknown tendril of consciousness pings him as father. First running then flying. Tests upon tests, experiments upon experiment, and the memories progressed with images of gentle-faced women sprinkled in between, women that cared for me, argued for me, and loved me. Women that I always heard had accidents that broke them and even killed. As the memories progressed so did my life, first a boy next to teenager and then a young man. My power grew, sprouting as I did in height through puberty, thickened and shaped as my jaw squared. As my life progressed the one constant were the men in white coats, the experiments continued but the pain had subsided long ago as I grew up. The pain being replaced by a need to be acknowledged, admired to be loved. The memories continued, my introduction as a new hero, the crowd their eyes, their hopes their dreams I could see it all. My first rescue, the gratification, the cheers and adulation, basking in the glory. Streams of images of my life as hero, galas, awards, helping people the glory of it all. Then the streams thickened, darkened, my first kill, intentional. He didn't deserve to live not after what he did to those children. I felt fury, burning fury so I unleashed it. 
A split second is all it took, and then panic. Nothing was left of the villain. Panic. Trouble. I would be in trouble, but Madeline she made it right. She took care of it, the first, the second and the next. There was always a next in the streams of memories, it was easier and easier, less guilt, less caring, more anger. How dare they go against me? How dare they? I am faster, stronger, better. The rage I felt burning each time, villains, citizens, crowds they would all learn. But Madeline was always there to calm me down, to love me, oh how I loved you and missed you, always there until she betrayed me. A tornado of rage, loneliness, feelings, memories and emotions as if I was experiencing it for the first time. They continued to pour into my mind and after what felt as if an eon had passed the stream slowed and emotions subdued. The ringing dimmed and the pressure released. I shakily stood, body burning with heat and dripping in sweat as if I'd just been baptized in the fiery waters of hell. I looked in the mirror pausing, catching my breath, absorbing the revelations. I stood still, quiet one moment then two then, with but a mere thought, I will the mass of my body to gently lift up until I'm supported only by my tippy toes. I stay there for a split second and then in an act defying the natural laws of the world my perfect toes break contact to the ground while I remain in the air suspended as a human-shaped chandelier. Fuck me I'm the homelander. Chapter 2, Chapter 2 I looked at myself in the costume and couldn't help but feel a twinge of pride. I looked good, I looked very fucking good. Unlike the real life actor this homelander could actually fill up the suit with his physique, no need to the obvious padding used in the show, though I had to admit the suit was also designed in a way to better accentuate the muscles groups. Okay so maybe there was a little bit of padding in all the right places to make everything pop out more but whatever it still looked good. I did a bunch of tests to see if I was dreaming, pinching myself with full strength did absolutely nothing. I accepted my situation and went about to test my powers. Fuck your flying. Flying was super fun, it's really hard to explain how it feels. It's not like free falling and it's not like you feel as if you are light as a feather. It's almost like I'm able to flex an invisible muscle and will myself to move through 3D space. One moment I'm on the ground the next I'm up on the ceiling. You learn to walk when you are young then you just do it instinctually, that's how it feels. It is instinct. That's really how it was with all the powers, they were instinctual. For super speed I simply willed myself to move faster and it happened. For laser vision I looked at something and thought about burning it then I felt the energy pool from my stomach to my head and I released it through my eyes. It was that way for all my powers, I thought it and it happened. The reason for that must be because I have all of Homelander's memories. It is also probably why my heightened senses are not simply assaulting me right now. The instinct to keep them at bay was probably burned in his body since he was young. I don't know why I'm here or what happened to Homelander. He was still there in my head kind of. It felt like he was a muted part of my subconscious. I felt his needs, emotions, his urges, his pride maybe it was an echo of his memories, I don't know what it meant but I was sure I was still me. And that was actually a big fucking problem. Yes it's every little boy's dream to become a hero like Superman, have cool powers, save the day and get a second chance at life. Except I didn't become Superman, nor Batman, or The Flash I became the Homelander. And I wasn't the fucking Homelander. I was still me. I was a 36 year old tech bro, okay a bit old for a bro, working as an analytics director at a crypto startup that may or may not have been dabbling in some NFT schemes. But that isn't the point. Before that I had spent my twenties climbing the corporate ladder in telecom and banking. I had been a workaholic who got dumped by his long-term girlfriend at 31 then four months later lost my job at BOA due to a restructuring. I then spent a year traveling the country and finding myself like the millennial that I was and realized I wasted my twenties working hard and not enjoying life. I had been more in love with the life I thought I wanted than what was actually in front of me. It ruined my relationship and it wasted my youth. This realization was followed by the next four years of partying and jumping from startup to startup trying my hand in the tech world, which brings me here. Late night partying, blow and inception bombs combined with being way too old for a full weekend of binging brought me to death's door. And now I'm the homelander, except I'm not.
I'm many things, but I'm not a narcissistic psychotic murderer even though I have his echo in my head, his head. So no problem, just don't be a narcissistic psychotic murderer, right? Not murdering people should be super easy, barely an inconvenience. Normally yes, except if these memories are right then I just landed in this body during season 3 of The Boys. That means that somewhere out there is the dreaded plane video, the bane of my existence. The boys are out there trying to find Soldier Boy, or maybe they already found him and he is coming back to the States and also I had a son somewhere hidden from me. Just at the mere thought of Ryan I feel a surge of emotion and an overwhelming compelling feeling to find him. He's my son. Fucking Echo. Yes, I feel Homelander's true emotions on the matter. Possessiveness, conflict, pride, even love for Ryan. Or at least love for the idea of Ryan and a family. I sighed, all issues that needed to be taken care of otherwise I would never be able to enjoy my new life. Complicated issues, especially the plane problem I did not want to become an outcast in this new world. My power won't matter for much if the people are going to be against me. Still there was hope, ideas were popping in my mind on how to deal with each of them. I had power, popular support and part of the media on my side. I will find a way. I won't waste time like I did before. Not with this amazing chance at a new life. I will crush them all if I need to. I thought as I stood straighter in the mirror. One by one I will take them on. But for now I have a board meeting to attend. Chapter 3, Chapter 3 I know these are difficult times, but with the greatest humility, I accept your nomination as CEO of Vought International. I heard Ashley say. Controlled superhearing was fantastic I could hear everything that was happening not only in Vought Tower but for miles on end if I wanted to. For now I was mostly focused on the meeting behind the double wide doors and waiting for my cue. You know, my mother used to say, before she died of cancer when I was 17. The room went silent the moment the heard the doors open. My apologies I hope I'm not interrupting. I said and looked at Ashley as she was frozen mid-speech. No, of course not sir. Ashley immediately says. I pause and look at her for a tense moment then smile. Ashley please, enough with the sir stuff. How many times do I have to tell you, call me John? She looked at me with big white eyes, stumped. Uh, yes sir, John the first mean. She finally blurted out. Thank you. Now, hello everyone. I said to the room of directors. Sorry, I'm late. Got stuck ironing my cape, for all my strength unfortunately I wasn't able to defeat the dreaded wrinkle. I said with a wink and sat down. The laugh to be polite, so I had terrible jokes, sue me. Okay, so seeing as it's my first board meeting, I thought perhaps we'd start by, uh, going around the room and giving you all a chance to introduce yourselves. Bill Marsh said the bald, past middle-aged man two seats down on my left next to Ashley. And I, for one, would like to thank you, Homelander, for giving me the opportunity to serve this board at such a pivotal moment in, uh, Vought's history. Pat Willis, sir. Said a chubby fellow on my right with a full head of graying hair. You've rid us of Stan Edgar and restored honesty, integrity and innovation to this corporation. He finished. One questions. The lady next to him said. With the changes around here, our EBITDA margins will drop a tiny bit. How do you want to handle that on the earnings call? I instantly felt irritation surging through me and I clenched my jaw in reflex. I did not like being challenged and put on the spot asking questions in a tone as if I didn't know what I was doing. Crush her head. Okay, calm the fuck down Echo. I pushed back the surge of emotions and took control. This was going to be a pivotal moment. I was now in charge of Vought as chairman of the board. What I do now would set up the tone for the company. What's your name? I asked through gritted teeth unblinking. Maureen. I held the silence and the stare for a tense two moments. Then I broke out into a cold smile. Maureen I repeated slowly, I am glad you asked that question. I said while standing from my sit walked slowly around the room in her direction. 
I was first going to wait until everyone was done their introductions but we might as well address this issue now. I stopped for a brief moment right behind her seat, I could feel her stiffen up. I let the tension build for a moment. I wanted her to know she fucked up by not letting everyone get their introductions in. From this moment on Vought will not be posting any profits. I said and slowly continued my counterclockwise walk around the table. Nobody knew what to say. Eventually Maureen's courage came back. I'm sorry sir. What do you mean Vought will not post any profits? Maureen, please call me John. I have had enough with the sir crap. Okay? I said looking at her she nodded. From this moment forward every single penny Vought makes will either be reinvested back into the business, in our employees, our Andy or in new ventures. Profits will be a thing of the past. I continued as I reached back to Ashley's seat. They all looked around the room like I said I was crazy, even Ashley. John, I don't think our shareholders will. Appreciate it? I asked cutting Maureen off. You are right they won't. That's why we need to give them something else to focus on we need to give them something bigger to look forward. I said turning towards the window, looking out at the expanse of New York City. You see Frederick Vought started this company as an R&D lab with the purpose to change people into something, better. I said accentuating the word. That eventually turned the lab into a superhero company, for better or for worse. Stan Edgar, for all his business acumen, only saw the worst that heroes had to offer and tried to steer the company back into its pharmaceutical roots, thinking that was the intended vision, of course he was wrong. I was laying it on thick now. Vought has always been about making people better so it's that root, that idea which we need to re-embrace. We need to be better. We have to make people better to make humanity greater. Vought will be the company that guides the next step in human evolution I said turning around suddenly. Not only on an individual and personal level but on for society as a whole. I said with fire in my tone. I could feel all of them watching me with wide eyes filled with trepidations for my own gaze must have looked manic to them. Vought will be humanity's guiding light in the dreadful dark. I raised my hand palm open and closed it into a fist. Vought will be hope. I finished loudly. They all just looked at me tense unsure what to say and I could tell a little bit scared. And, and Maureen stuttered. How exactly are we going to do that? Quite simple my dear, I relaxed my pose and brought both hands behind my back. Vought is going into space. Chapter 4, Chapter 4 Space? Ashley asked. Well it's more like she blurted it out. She's been trained not to question me so I saw her jerking reaction when she realized what she did. I only smiled at her and looked around the room. The directors were all looking at me incredulously. I have half a mind to think they would actually prefer psychotic Homelander with no business answers instead of crazy space idea Homelander. Yes, space. I confirmed calmly. Vought has all the basic ingredients to turn humanity into a multi-planetary species. It is the next step in the evolution of our society. We will be at the forefront for it. I continued while sitting back in my chair. Of course that will be the overarching mission of the company. There are many steps in between. I leaned back in my chair getting more comfortable. First we will start with something small and reasonable such as telecom. We will launch satellites into space and provide internet and phone service at a reasonable price to millions of underserved rural Americans. But we don't have any aerospace experience or telecom, not on that scale at least. Bill Marsh said. And launching things into orbit is expensive, very expensive. He said surely. You are right of course. I confirmed. We don't have that experience so we will either have to partner up with or acquire companies in the industry. However what we do have is an advantage that no other company has in the world. I paused and looked around the table to see if any of them will jump at an answer. They didn't. Me. I stated firmly. The looked at me waiting to elaborate so I did. 
while our greatest minds will be working diligently on reusable rockets, cheaper fuel, and better engines I can fly the satellites into orbit myself. I usually fly up there regularly to get some peace and quiet. You have no idea how noisy things get when you have super hearing. I knew from his memories that Homelander did periodically fly into orbit to admire the Earth. He liked how small it looked. It made him feel big like he could crush it if he wanted to. By my estimation I should be able to fly anywhere between 1 and 10 tons depending on sturdiness of the structure I'm flying. I'll leave that to the brainiacs to figure out. That should be between one third and half the cost of satellites. That seemed to open their eyes and I swear I saw the gears turn in their brains. I'm not naive. I said. I know advancing humanity's space footprint and making our species multiplanetary will take a ridiculous amount of money. And I am not against making profits if that's what you are worried. The profits will simply be reinvested into something greater. Think of the resources out there for the taking through asteroid or moon mining. Think of the new technologies the research will bring. I paused to let their imagination run. The telecom venture will be our proof of concept. I'm sure at least the US government will want to get in on the action. I said slyly. They love putting things into space. Especially if they can block China by having an exclusive contract with us. From there we'll expand and expand and expand. I finished firmly. I looked at them and I saw them smile. I knew I had them. An outrageous idea suddenly became possible. The sharks were smelling blood in the water and wanted their share. The meeting lasted for another two hours as we discussed my half-assed plan of bringing glory to humankind and how we would approach the announcement on the earnings calls. As they were leaving I asked Ashley to stay. Yes, John, she asked apprehensively. She wasn't sure if I was just putting up a show for the directors. She was testing the waters. Yes Ashley, I am serious about calling me John and I am serious about everything I have said today. You and me I said getting close to her that she could feel my breath on her forehead. Her heart was thumping loud and clear. She was scared but to her credit she only barely trembled. We are going to lead Vought into a new and glorious era. I took a lock of her hair, felt it between my fingertips, I wasn't wearing the red gloves, I felt they were too bulky for normal use. I pushed the lock back behind her ear. And I am just as serious when I say that you need to take better care of yourself and your hair. I continued and stepped away from her. You seem to be missing a bunch of clumps. Now, can you do me a favor and find the deep and bring him here? He might have misinterpreted my words and so I feel like he's about to do something very stupid and I need the both of you here to clear it up. Yes, yes her voice trembled and she rushed out the door. The moment the door closed I could hear her breaths of relief. I had to admit part of me was enjoying seeing her squirm beneath my gaze. Chapter 5, Chapter 5 You wanted to see me sir? It took about 10 minutes for Ashley to bring him up and unsurprisingly he was accompanied by his wife Cassandra. Yes I did deep. I paused to look at him and then at his wife. She was hot by my standards. Pink lingerie, perky tits, I let my eyes roam over all of her body. Rip her clothes off, cuck him. My right eye twitched at the stray thought. Fucking echo. I could see that she was a bit unnerved but the deep didn't dare say anything, not only he was scared of me but I practically smelled his desire to be back in my good graces, back in the spotlight. I turned back to him. I couldn't help but overhear your meeting in crime analytics earlier today and I think you may have misinterpreted my intentions in the conversation we had yesterday. I told him. Oh, okay he looked at me confused and so did his wife. You don't want me to take control to clean house of dissenters, he continued unsure. Poor choice of words on my part. I stated. What my intention was to ensure we have a clean house. One that works efficiently, in harmony. The folks using social media to express their grievances against Vought, against me well they are not in harmony with the rest of the team but they are still part of the team. I paused. 
and crime analytics is a very, very important team. It's how we maintain our image, by solving and preventing crime. A hero cannot be a hero if he doesn't tackle crime. Isn't that right? Yes, of course. He replied. Well said, sir. Ashley replied. My head snapped towards her and she immediately fixed her mistake. John, I mean John. I turned back to the deep. So you see we need to keep the team happy, so they can work effectively like little bees. It's why I've made you head of crime analytics, nominally, Barbara will still be in charge of the actual day-to-day -day operations of course. Then I laughed, snorted more like and stole a look at Ashley. You obviously don't have an analytical bone in your body. Ashley joined in the laughter and so did his wife. I could hear they were both genuine in their laughter. Making fun of the deep felt pretty good but I turned back serious and continued. So you see what I want you to do is to go there and inspire them, be their shining light, become their friend. As your first assignment I want you to get to know everyone, find out how they take their coffee, their hobbies, the names of their pets. He looked at me confused. Endear yourself to them, become their trusted ear, their connection to the seven. Make them feel like they are part of the team. You are the only one that can do it. I, I am. Of course. The rest of the team they are, prickly, well they are a bunch of assholes really. I stated. You on the other hand, are approachable, friendly, a real man of the people. Your telepathy grants you something that the rest simply don't have. Oof. Man I was going to need to rinse my mouth after spewing this much bullshit. It does? His eyes were big, questioning and absorbing everything I said. I moved close to him and did the classic Homelander move where I put my right hand behind his head and slightly pulled him in. Empathy, deep, empathy. You can connect with the common man. So can you do this for us Kevin? I used his real name for added effect. For the team? For me, and I looked him straight in the eyes. Why yes, yes, I mean yes. Of course, he finally said confidently. Excellent. I let him go and turned back towards Ashley. Now to fix the earlier miscommunication, we'll bring Barb back on board and then you and her are going to conduct performance reviews and you are going to ensure that everyone gets a bonus increase between 20 and 30 percent. Understood? I asked the room and everyone agreed. It took another hour to find Barbara and get her back on board. All it cost was some heartfelt apologies plus a 50% raise in comp and 50% retention bonus of total comp. Fuck it Vought had money. I could have just fired the deep or called him a moron but that would be counterproductive. The deep was an idiot but he was very malleable. He would become my loyal idiot. I did not plan on isolating myself like Homelander did in the show. One man a kingdom does not make. Plus I had too many enemies. The boys were gunning for me and so was the government, well parts of the government. Soldier Boy was going to make an appearance today as well. I needed allies, loyal soldiers who would do my bidding because they believed in me and my cause but mostly because they believed in me. I'm not stupid I know the deep can be wishy-washy, but I also know that deep down, pun intended, he wants to do the right thing. He yearns for respect, for acknowledgement, and even to repent for his previous crimes. With the right pressure points, a sprinkle of fear and a bit of respect he can be a most loyal tool. A dumb tool but loyal. After all I don't want all my soldiers to be smart. Too smart and they start asking too many questions. The next of my potential allies are A-Train and Black Noir. A-Train knows too much so he either needs to be brought back into the fold or eliminated. I didn't want to eliminate A-Train because he could be very useful. He was still popular and having a speedster on the team was always a good idea. Plus I wanted to minimize deaths. It is a goddamn testament to Edgar, Stillwell and Ashley's skills, but as a whole really that they have been able to cover up so much crap. 
A train can be convinced back in his motivations mirrored the deep thought he is not nearly as malleable. Black Noir was a the one and the most needed one. He was by far the most capable in his abilities both in his heroics and clandestine actions. The man was a trained ninja, stoic, silent and deadly and he had ridiculous high ratings. When you don't say a word, people just project their own image onto you. I know this isn't like the comics so I have nothing to fear there but the question is if he is Edgar's man or not. Even so his feelings on Soldier Boy were clear enough. If I give him Soldier Boy that should earn his loyalty for a time at least. Provided I can actually take down Soldier Boy, considering how though he is I might have to chuck him into a star or something, which isn't a bad idea now that I think about it. A problem for later. For now I need to deal with my first meeting of the seven. What's left of them? Chapter 6, Chapter 6 I watched leaning back comfortably in my chair as the team filled the room. And when I say watched I do mean watched, mostly Maeve and Starlight. Supervision was great, fantastic for a pervert and Homelander was a pervert, good thing I was kind of as well. Of course I'm going to peek, what kind of red-blooded American man wouldn't peek? Even though I had memories of me and Maeve doing it I was still enjoying the view. She was well endowed, with firm round breast and a very toned body. Each supple curve of her physique brought memories to the front where we were joined as one. A cocktail of conflicting emotions surged in my chest. My eyes wandered to below the belt and hot dam, I mean I shouldn't have been surprised but hey it's technically my first time seeing it. The carpet matched the fiery drapes but she definitely needed to do some trimming. Muff dive her. Can't argue with that one echo, I really want to. Too bad she fucking hates my guts, another issue to work on. Maeve was powerful and popular especially in the LGBT plus ally sector. As a longtime member of the Seven she gave credibility to any issue we tackled. I'm not going to pretend I can make her an ally but at the very least I needed to neutralize her, one way or another. There was another benefit to keeping Maeve around that Homelander had pointed out. She was by far the strongest female soup. She was stronger and more durable than most of the male soups as well. Her DNA was precious, her eggs were valuable. Even if we didn't produce a child they were still gold research material. Homelander wasn't stupid, per se. I had his memories and he had read up the research materials on compound V, okay the short notes. The compound reacted differently for every person, hence the different powers and the incredibly high mortality rate, especially in adults. It was obviously something in the DNA some sort of mutant or metahuman genes that the scientists haven't been able to fully identify and refine the formula of V to properly interact with them. But they must be getting close otherwise Stan Edgar wouldn't have put his hopes on 24V. So if it's in the DNA then that means it's hereditary, which means offspring of soups will more likely be able to adapt to having V in their system. So Maeve was valuable, not only for me but for mankind, but also because I really wanted to dive in that muff again. I turned my gaze back to Annie who was just about to sit next to me, she was co-captain after all. I couldn't help feel displeased yet horny. Bend that bitch over. I already felt the blood rush downstairs. Fucking echo, or was that me? I had a thing for tiny blondes. She was slimmer in figure than Maeve with smaller but perkier tits. Body toned as well with pink strawberry lips, both sets, trim too. Now that I think about it, everyone looks slightly better than they looked in the show, less wrinkles more toned, more vibrant. I can't tell if this is because of the V or my enhanced senses, it's probably the V. Thank you all for coming. I stood as everyone settled in. Today is not only the beginning of a new Vought but also of a new Seven. Earlier today I had a very productive board meeting where we settled on the new direction the company will be taking. I said enthusiastically. I could tell not only from their expressions but from their heartbeats that they were a bit concerned. My enthusiastic face must have been a bit manic. Ashley and the executive team are working right now on messaging and I don't want to spoil anything but our new mission is quite high up there, ha. Huh? I'm fucking hilarious. I started walking around the room. So as Vought will rise up from its ashes so must we. I paused. 
We must become the superhero team that we were always meant to be. That the world needs us to be. I said with enthusiasm in my voice. I stopped on the opposite side of the table where the V opened up to face all of them. They were looking at me with mixed expressions. Mostly distrust and disgust coming from Starlight and Maeve. That means there will be changes not only to how we operate but how all of Vought's heroes operate. Oh really? What are we going to go around kissing more babies? More talk shows? Sell more action figures? Maeve interrupted. I stared at her for a moment then gave her the patented cold Homelander smile. Oh there will be quite a bit of PR stunts and baby kissing but I was thinking of something a bit bigger and more serious. I replied and continued my walk. I'm not happy with how our heroes are performing. They are the face of this company and too many of them have their heads up their asses. I paused. Over policing, not providing first aid, under patrolling, focusing on the wrong type of crime. Take someone, let's say like Blue Hawk. That got a train's attention. How many situations could have been resolved without violence if he had just de-escalated instead? How many lawsuits would Vought had avoided? Sure he appeals to a certain demographic, I said whimsically with a smile, but it's really his attitude that is the problem. He's a bit too sure, too expressive in his misinformed opinions. That needs to change. I said firmly. So what, you want us to believe you suddenly care about the well-being of underprivileged communities? Starlight commented ruefully. Do it. My smile puckered with my lips and my head twitched sideways. I had to fight the urge to rip he costume off and spank her for insubordination. Yes. I replied simply. Time are changing and so must we. Change must come from the top and to enact change we must become that change. I said spinning some old corporate bullshit execs usually say to make the troops feel good and I am serious about change. We will bring in every single hero to re-evaluate their training, their skills, their methods, and their psychological profiles so that they will be better matched to the appropriate communities to safeguard. I continued. That actually took them by surprise, though I still saw doubt in all their eyes. Starlight I got her attention. This is your time to shine. As co-captain of the team I want you to lead this retraining program. She sifted in her seat and furrowed her cute brows, I swear her pink buttons just got perkier, her heart increased its rhythm. First aid, de-escalation techniques, community outreach, press training, performance evaluations, really anything you need to make sure our heroes are better equipped to serve their communities. You will have free reign to use whatever resources you need. Ashley already knows about this. I said and paused by the window. You're really serious about this? She asked unsure. I had everyone's rasp attention now. I am. A train will provide you support. I said turning my head to him. Maven Black Noir I want you to lead the combat evaluation and training. Why? Maeve asked. They all went through combat training once. True, they did. But most have only dealt with unpowered civilians. Times are changing there are more rogue heroes, super villains if you will. I replied calmly looking out the window. You two will play a special part of this program. I let the tension build for a moment as they absorbed my words waiting for me to elaborate. A lot of our heroes will not like the new changes, they are set in their ways, they have an attitude that needs correcting. Oh many of them will pledge their allegiance to our new way in flowery words only to fall back into their old habits the moment we look away. I suddenly turned back to them, hands behind my back, my smile gone. I want you two to break anyone that you feel is not genuine in their efforts or their promises. I said coldly. And I don't mean figuratively, I mean literally. Any whiff of treason, laziness of empty platitudes. I surprised myself with how aggressive my tone became accentuating each word, the echoes rage fueling them, bones, arms, legs, spines you will do what is necessary to take them off the board and if training accidents were to happen, then so be it, I finished my tone low and cold. The soups need to understand they now answer to a new supreme authority. I said with more fire than intended, a familiar surge of energy pooling inside of me. 
I will not have insurgency, insubordination in my house. As I looked at the team I could tell they were scared, I could not only see it but also smell it on them and for good reason. My eyes had started glowing and it was only when I pushed the energy down and felt the pull of gravity that I realized I had also raised myself above the floor. Chapter 7, Chapter 7 Homelander? Did you hear me? Annie asked. I raised my left finger in a motion to shush her as I was concentrating on the television. After a moment I released it. Sorry, what? I pretended not to have heard her. I said we need to handle this. Now. She reiterated. Uh, yeah, of course we do. Okay. So, book slots on all the Sunday shows. Or maybe a press conference will be better? I posed to Ashley. Or both. We'll have to communicate that we have everything under control. That's smart. So smart. Ashley and her mini-me reiterated. So, we're gonna. Jesus, I meant that we need to stop this guy. Starlight yelled. I instantly felt myself snapping. Punish her. Quiet echo. Watch your tone, darling. I said ignoring the urge to bend her over my knee and spank her for insubordination. I'm sorry, I just mean, don't you think that maybe the best way to handle this is to find him? I gave her a cold smile. Oh, what a bright idea. Obviously. My tone dripping with sarcasm. But tell me, darling, let's say we get the team together and we all go and find him. Then what? I asked rhetorically. I didn't give her a chance to respond. Do we have a big old fight in the middle of the city? This is an unknown super who is obviously not in control of his powers. We have no idea what he is capable of but considering he just toppled a city block then we can assume he is very powerful. If we approach this the wrong way we could be endangering hundreds of if not thousands of people. So yes Annie we will find him but we need a plan first. And more importantly we need to communicate that plan with the public to ensure they are not put into further danger and that is why Ashley will be booking media time for us. I told her firmly. Yup, she was taken back. She didn't think I had put any thought into this. In the meantime you will go and ask crime analytics to collaborate with police on finding this super and then you round up the team and come back here. I will talk with the chief of police and get the department's cooperation. I paused for a split second. I will ask that officers report on the location but to not approach the suspect. I don't want any of them to trigger him and cause another explosion. It will be the same messaging for all of our heroes in the field and the public as well. We won't approach him until we have a plan to neutralize him or get him out of the city. Got it? She continued looking at me shocked and I held her gaze raising my eyebrows in question. Right, that actually makes sense. She finally said. Brilliant. Very excellent. The Ashleys echoed. Then what are you all standing around for? Go. We don't have time to waste. As they turned to leave I couldn't help myself and peeked, g-string all three of them. Nice. I had my call with the police chief and I assured him we were on it and he assured me he'll give the orders for the officers not to approach. The police rank and file fucking loved Homelander especially after he dipped his toes into the alt-right with Stormfront. It took about 30 minutes for the team to file in, well most of it. A-Train was doing his apology conference with Blue Hawk while Deep was. So, small setback. Starlight said as she sat next to me. It was me her maven noir at the table. The crime analytics department is out for the day. Now that caught me by surprise. What do you mean it's out for the day? I asked incredulously. Apparently, Deep, as the new head of CA, gave them the day off to have a social so he could get to know his team better. Starlight said with only a small hint his incredulity. You made Deep head of crime analytics. He's a fucking moron. Maeve yelled. I rubbed my temples in frustration. Well at least I can't say that the guy wasn't trying. Nominal head. I replied frustrated. Oh, 
Don't look at me like that. He needed a way to get back in the good graces of the company and the department has been complaining they don't have a direct line to the heroes, to us. I paused. I thought it would be the place where he could do the least amount of damage maybe even learn something. Besides, Barbara is still in charge of ops and with a very hefty raise I might add. Maeve made to protest but I cut her off. Never mind that. Did you manage to contact any of them to come back? I asked Starlight. Yui got a hold of Barbara, she was home, she managed to reach a few of the analysts so at least some should be coming back but... And she hesitated. Just spit it out already. Apparently they are pretty drunk. I couldn't help but roll my eyes. Fucking deep. Well drunk analysts are better than no analysts. I finally said. Let's focus on what we can control for now. We have a powerful unknown super who is not in full control of his abilities. What makes you say that? How do you know? Maeve asked intrigued for the first time. High body language. I replied. From the footage he looked like he was having a panic attack, like he was in pain. I don't think he meant to do what he did but that doesn't change that he is unstable, dangerous and powerful. We don't know the full scope of his abilities, how sturdy or how impervious he is to attack. Subduing him from far away is a risk we trigger his powers, from up close it's the same risk. While he is within city limits we have to be very careful how we approach him not only for our safety but for the public at large. We want to minimize any potential damage. Maeve was looking at me like I had grown two heads. Understandable, I didn't sound like the homelander she knew. I continued. The police have already agreed to only report and not approach the suspect. Ashley's team is working on getting the same message to the rest of our heroes in the field. I looked at Maeve and Black Noir. This will be a good test to see who can follow instructions and who will need retraining. Noir nodded. Okay, and what is your grand plan to stop him? Maeve asked and they all looked at me expectantly. Well once we locate him I think, especially if he is in the city, that either you or Starlight approach him. If I or the other guys do it he might see us as threats and trigger his power. I replied. You will try to de-escalate, see if you can convince him to turn himself in so we can help him and all that jazz. In the meantime the rest of the team will create a perimeter and calmly try to evacuate people. I will observe from a vantage point in the air. If I see that his power gets triggered I will swoop and grab him and fly him up and out over the ocean as fast as I can. Hopefully he is not strong enough to resist me and we avoid any damage. Crickets. That could actually work. Annie looked at me mouth half open in shock. Yes, Starlight an actual plan, it's like Homelander has been specifically trained for this his whole life, to be fair Homelander stopped caring about making plans long ago. He would usually fly and smash things up and let Vought clean up his mess, for the most part. He did really well in the very public situations. But if it doesn't. I said getting their attention again. A train is our best bet after me. Along with Deep. Now they thought I was stupid for sure. A train they could understand but Deep was practically useless most of the time. So I elaborated. In the worst case scenario where I'm incapacitated a train will have to grab him at top speed and chuck him in the ocean. Deep will then drag him to the bottom. Hopefully he will either drown or be incapacitated indefinitely. It will at least buy us more time to think of our next move. I looked at them as they let my plan sink in. But none of that matters if we can't find him. So in the meantime Starlight you work on getting a hold of Deep, A-Train and the CA team. Maybe you work with Ashley to get our messaging to the rest of the heroes in the field. They will listen to you, they respect you. I said firmly. Noir, you go to IT and see if you can get some in-ear portable radios. We will need to shore up our communication in the field. Don't want any mishaps because we couldn't talk to each other. He nodded. I have a few media spots where I will reassure the public that we do know what we are doing and that they should take caution if they encounter the suspect. Now any questions? There were no questions. 
Moir didn't talk as a general rule because of his injuries while Starlight and Maeve were still too shocked by my sudden leadership and competence to question me. Good then dismissed. I finished firmly and made to leave the room. Makeup needed me there in 10 minutes.